We are now we are now live. Thank you. So good evening. Uh, my name is Alexandra Mathers and I am a planner with the city of Brantford. Uh, we are here tonight to discuss the city initiated zoning bylaw amendments relating to short term rental accommodations. So tonight we are joined by Councillor Antoski, Councillor Carpenter, Councillor Wall, Councillor Martin, and Councillor Utley, and Councillor Celeste, um, as well as we are joined by Joe Muto, the Manager of Development Planning, and Casey Pongrass, a senior planner who will be taking notes for the meeting tonight. We are also joined by Tanya Daniels, City Clerk, Jill Binkley, Supervisor of Elections, Licensing and Administrative Services, and Alexandria Pleck, Licensing Compliant Officer, who will be able to provide any answers to any questions relating to the registry program. We are also joined by Heidi DeVries, the General Manager of People, Legislative Services and Planning. So just to go over a quick agenda tonight, I will provide um, a background and overview, as well as the proposed regulations, definition and location for the, permitted, for the proposed use. There will also be a uh, an opportunity after the presentation for public comments and questions. So this is the first public meeting um, regarding this, this proposal um, in order to gather public feedback on the proposed regulations. The next meeting will be the statutory public meeting required by the Planning Act presented to the Committee of the Whole. Members of the public will also have opportunity to speak for or against the proposed regulations at that meeting. So by way of background, short-term rental accommodations are seen as a dwelling unit, room, or other form of living space, such as an RV or yurt, which is available for rent on a short-term basis and where rental is typically facilitated without in-person interactions. Municipalities across Ontario, Canada, and the world have be begun to regulate short-term rental accommodations through zoning and licensing measures. In Brantford, the interest in short-term rental accommodations is growing. In November 2019, Brantford City Council approved municipal licensing of hotels and motels and directed staff to research and provide a report to Council considering the feasibility of licensing short-term rental accommodations. As a result, planning and licensing staff conducted research relative to short-term accommodations. Um, this included a review of the accommodations available in Brantford today. Um, a review of comparator municipalities and policies that apply. Uh, this, also, this review also included reviewing the City of Brantford Zoning Bylaw 16090 and the County of Brant Zoning Bylaw 6116, which applies to the annexed lands. Both zoning bylaws currently do not define or regulate short-term rental accommodations, so this is the purpose of this application. At the March 2nd Committee of the Whole Operations and Administrative administration meeting, licensing staff brought forward a report and recommendation for short-term rental accommodation registry program. The registry program will be implemented once the zoning bylaw amendment is approved and appeal period has ended. At the March meeting, the committee of a whole amended the recommendation to include parameters regarding principal residence and parking requirements, which I will further discuss later in this presentation. So just to go over the what we are proposing. So we're proposing a draft uh, definition for short-term rental accommodations in both the city and the county bylaw that applies to the annex lands, um, providing regulations relating to the use and propose um, appropriate locations for the use. So the following definition has been drafted based on staff reviews of other municipalities that define the use, as well as the needs of the city of Brantford. The following definition has been drafted. Um, Short-term rental accommodations shall mean a dwelling unit or their part of in which temporary accommodation is made available to members of the traveling public for a maximum of 28 consecutive days per stay and does not include a bed and breakfast establishment. This definition will address short-term rental accommodations um, that they shall take place within or as part of a dwelling unit. The purpose of including the maximum number of consecutive days is in order to differentiate between a short-term and a long-term rental use. Any rentals above 28 days would then be considered a long-term rental. The proposed definition will also distinguish between the 
short-term rental accommodation use and the bed and breakfast establishment use. Bed and breakfast establishments are currently defined and regulated under both bylaws. Bed and breakfast establishments are only permitted to be in a portion of a principal residence and are operated by the owner of the unit. Bed and breakfasts are traditionally secondary to primary residential use and the owner and op operator um, is to be present during this day. Meals are sometimes provided through bed and breakfast establishments. And this differs from short-term rental accommodations where an entire dwelling unit can be rented out and does not require the owner to be present during the stay. So in regards to um, proposed locations, staff are uh, proposing to permit um, short-term rental accommodations where residential uses are permitted. So this would include all residential zones as well as um, commercial zones where residential uses are, are permitted as well um, the agricultural zones under the County of Brant zoning bylaw that applies to the annexed lands also includes residential uses. So um, to go over the proposed zoning changes, um, we're proposing a, prin a principal residence requirement prohibiting short-term rental accommodations on the same lot as a bed and breakfast establishment, parking regulations, um, applying principal and secondary use or accessory use regulations and requiring registration. And today we are here to, to gather any feedback that you may have um, as members of the public on the proposed regulations. Accommodations to be located within a principal residence. Planning staff are of the opinion that defining a principal residence for short-term accommodation use, that the entirety of an accessory dwelling unit shall be included as part of the owner's main residence. Requiring that short-term rental accommodations are within a principal residence will remove pressures on long-term housing markets as it will be, it will prohibit investors from purchasing residential properties for the sole purpose of creating short-term rental accommodations. Right. Um, this will further ensure that those units um, are then available for owners or long-term rental use. Allowing an entire accessory dwelling unit on a principal residence lot to, um, <coughs> sorry, um, will also allow for the present principal resident to um, have autonomy over their, their how their, how their, um, home is used. This approach has been um, taken by some municipalities, such as the town of Oakville. We are also pro um, proposing to prohibit short-term rental accommodations on the same lot as bed and breakfast establishments. This is in order to not create lots where multiple types of resident uh, accommodations are taking place and will continue to allow for the current regulations for bed and breakfast establishments to continue. In regards to parking, planning staff are currently in the process of reviewing parking regulations and requirements for short-term accommodations and are considering a proposed regulation. At the March 2nd, 2021 Committee of the Whole meeting, committee provided that, the, um, that they would like to see the primary residence uh, driveway to be able to accommodate a vehicle per bedroom rented. Um, through our research, staff have um, reviewed competitor municipalities um, and some do apply parking, parking regulations. Um, most competitor, um, comparator municipalities have allowed for principal uh, use parking regulations to apply. So in for an example, that would be if an individual rented out their entire principal residence as one unit, um, the required parking for that principal residence use would be what is required. Um, planning staff are also proposing um, that tandem parking be permitted um, for a short-term accommodation use. Um, this is consistent with parking regulations for additional dwelling units. So we are also proposing that primary and accessory use regulation shall apply to short-term rental accommodations. This means any development relating to the use um, would be required to meet the regulations for the prime principal, principal use under the zone. And finally, we're proposing that registration through the registry program shall be required. Um, thank you for your time. And, and please let me know if you have any questions or comments that you would like to like for me to address.
Thank you. Okay, Alexandra, at this time we have uh, Mr. David Prang that would like to ask a question. Um, if we can release his microphone. One moment. Would you like to unmute David, please? Uh, yep, yeah, there we go. I'm able to now, thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation, Alexandra. And uh, yeah, I'm here representing the Chamber of Commerce, Brantford Brant. Um, I think uh, you submitted our uh, policy brief uh, after a, a short survey of um, some of our uh, my colleagues across the province. Um, yeah, and we had uh, we were approached by some of our uh, hotelier memberships around uh, support for this uh, this type of regulation as well. Um, I just wanted some uh, clarification around the the parking uh, issue in that uh, it seems that you know given the current in some neighborhoods there's lots of parking available for um, for residents that are that live in their homes and um, but in other neighborhoods in the city in the, or in the community rather communities rather uh, there may be you know there are currently parking issues uh, given the the permitted uses of those homes now so um, how how does that how how will that be navigated, I guess, uh, through the, the implementation of, of this bylaw? So thank you, uh, David, for your question. Um, so at this, at this time, um, planning staff are currently reviewing what um, comparative municipalities are, are doing in regards to parking and are taking into account what um, the committee of the whole at the licensing meeting um, provided. So at this time, we're still looking to, to make those uh, regulations. Um, at minimum, it would include that the principal use or accessory use would in include, uh, would, be the, would be the required parking. So I think the best way to describe that would be through an example. So say if you had, um, a principal residence that was a single detached dwelling and it was your home and you decided to rent it out as a single um, house on on Airbnb or VRBO um, then that parking space that is attached to your or is for your um, residential unit so one parking space um, is then um, what would be required for the use. Similarly, accessory dwelling units each require a par one parking space. Um, and those would be um, what would be provided as the parking. Um, at this time, we're also proposing that um, that tandem parking um, be provided. So that means one car can park in front of the other as, a, as permitted. Um, as well, um, we're looking into the proposal that um, was provided at the uh, Committee of the Whole meeting, which was a request for um, one parking space per, uh, per uh, sorry, uh, th th that the driveway must be able to accommodate a vehicle per bedroom rented. So this would then apply in, a, in an example um, if there was a five bedroom house that that is how many parking spaces would be required so we're currently reviewing this and um, um, would like to take any comments that the the public may may have um, another opportunity is to also require um, owner operators to include the number of parking spaces that they have to offer on their um, listing that way the individuals who are renting out the unit are aware of how many parking spaces are available prior to renting the use. Um, I hope that gives a, a bit of a understanding of what type of regulations we are looking um, to propose for short term accommodations and if you had any comments, please let me know. Very good. No, thank you. That uh, yeah. The the proposed regulations and your, your answers sort of cover uh, some of the concerns that were raised by our members, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge at this point. Thank you. 
Any follow-up question, David? Uh, no, I'm I'm good. Thank tonight. you very much. Thank you. Okay, Alexandra, we now have a Nathan uh, Rotman that would like to ask a question. Sorry, Nathan, are you uh, muted? Sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry, Alexander, it looks like um, Nathan's uh, mic is not working. We'll just keep trying one moment. Hello. Hello. No. Hi. Sorry. Is this the period for giving our deputation, or is this just for questions? You can provide uh, comments or questions that you that you have. Okay. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Rotman. I am the senior manager of public policy with Airbnb in Canada. Uh, speaking to you from Toronto. Thanks so much for hearing uh, from us as well today. <laughs> um. I'd like to start by thanking you for your leadership during this COVID-19 pandemic. It has been a difficult, challenging year for the global travel industry, and we recognize our responsibility to support the province and municipalities across Ontario who are working hard to control the spread of the virus. Since the uh, crisis began, we have made it clear to our guests and our hosts that this is not the time for leisure travel and communicated directly with hosts and guests uh, advertising uh, this fact on our various social media channels in the spring. Uh, as well as making it easier for our guests to cancel reservations and receive refunds so no one felt it necessary to travel in order to avoid penalties or lose hard-earned money. In Brantford, dozens of individuals, and I want to underline the dozens, uh, are, uh, individuals and families are engaged in home sharing to make ends meet, share experiences with visitors, and support neighborhood small businesses. For many, earning money through occasional home sharing makes it possible for them to afford to stay in their homes. In many ways, uh, your community is indicative of, of our Canadian community at large. Airbnb survey data reports that hosts in Canada spend, say they spend more than half the money they earn through the platform on expenses like mortgage payments and household bills. Mm -hmm. While every municipality has unique needs when it comes to regulating short-term rentals, we encourage Brantford to consider the problem you're trying to solve when designing your regulatory regime. In many smaller and mid-sized cities in Canada, we find that municipalities are most, most successful when they focus first on registration and second on nuisance issues. And this is why we would be happy to work with your municipality on the following. First, the idea that a registration system is put in place is a very good idea. Putting in place a registration process for short-term rentals allows municipalities to monitor hosting activity and determine a local responsible party should an issue arise. Where we've, when, what we've found is that online and simple registration systems are often the best, uh, and the fewer the barriers in place uh, to registration tend to see the greatest levels of compliance. Secondly, with regard to nuisance issues and enforcement, enforcement is most often effective when tied to specific quality of life concerns. While these issues are rare, some cities have targeted short-term rental enforcement in response to complaints about nuisance properties or other neighbor concerns. This is why we provide municipal leaders like yourselves, uh, as well as neighbors with a tool where they can access us 24 seven to report nuisance concerns. In some municipalities, they have put in place things like a good neighbor policy, uh, kind of like a three strikes and you're out if you leave the garbage out, if you uh, are causing problems in the, in the local neighborhood. We also note that you plan to restrict short-term rentals to an individual's primary residence. We're concerned that this approach doesn't take into consideration the types of people who are visiting Brantford and that it will have a detrimental impact on your city's economy, especially at a time when restaurants and small businesses are struggling to get back on their feet. 
Without flexibility regarding primary and secondary residences, many hosts would be unable to continue sharing their homes. Most cities have always had some dedicated rentals in their community. While the advent of uh, platforms has made it easier to find these listings, it is by no means a new phenomenon. The need for these types of rentals is real and diverse. In our experience, a balance on this issue is possible by looking at a two-tiered approach that ensures simple, light-touch requirements for people who are sharing their primary residence while requiring stricter regulatory frameworks for dedicated rentals. You can look at examples uh, of cities like Calgary, uh, which would be the best example of that type of a, a, a situation. This can sometimes take the form of higher licensing fees or stricter inspection and reporting requirements. Finally, uh, our community safety, both online and offline, is, uh, is a top priority of Airbnb. There have been more than a half billion guest arrivals to our listings to date, and negative incidents are extremely rare. Even so, we're always working to improve our platform, our policies, and our protections, because even one incident is one too many. As a result, we have pioneered a series of tools that are, ready, that are available to Airbnb users at no charge, and which cover all jurisdictions where we operate. We have a neighbor support line, airbnb.ca slash neighbors, where you can report nuisance issues and where you can find a phone number to report uh, any uh, problems that are happening in real time. We banned all party houses uh, from our platform in accordance with our policies. And we recently uh, created an even more uh, extensive uh, ban on any kinds of events happening in our listings. And finally, uh, we have a high risk detection tool. Uh, in addition to a, a manual uh, uh, detection system that flags potentially problematic reservations for review, we also in January of 2020 uh, restricted uh, bookings to guests, uh, re restricted anyone from under anyone under 25 years of age from booking a whole home rental in their local area where they live. This prevents people from uh, young people from from booking. Uh, uh, homes nearby to host events uh, in particular. We look forward to working with uh, Council. We sent you a letter. You can feel free to email me back if you have any specific questions. And obviously, I'd be happy to answer questions if any councillors have any at this time as well. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, we have a Shanti Bola that would like to ask a question. Go ahead, Shanti. Okay, we're having a little difficulty with her microphone. One moment, please. Hi, sorry, that's, uh, this is Nathan. That, that's my colleague. I think she's just listening in as well. Okay, Alexandra, sorry about that. She's not unmuting her microphone. Does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, Councillors Select, I see your, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. I, I don't know a lot about Airbnb, but if we have the, uh, I think he identified himself as the president of Airbnb. My perception, and I've never used one, but my perception would be that you rent the entire house. Uh, now I'm hearing that there, there could be, if it's a five bedroom house, there could be rental of five rooms within that house, or I guess four, because the proposal is that the it has to be owner occupied. Tell me the difference between an Airbnb renting one bedroom in a home What's the difference of that and a bed and breakfast that doesn't serve breakfast? What's the difference? 
Thank you, Councillor Celeste. So um, from the proposed um, regulations and definition, short-term accommodations um, would include both situations of a single bedroom um, being rented out or the entire unit, um, Airbnb and other uses or other websites such as uh, VRBO allow that as a use um, or as, as a, a rental opportunity. Um, whereas bed and breakfasts are um, typically uh, a more traditional use um, and they would require the owner to be present and ocu like occupying the house at the time of the um, rental, whereas um, short-term rental accommodations then would allow for um, the individual to not be at home. So if they rented out their entire space, um, they wouldn't. There is no requirement of the owner to be home at the time of the of the rental. But that has to be their primary residence, correct? Yes. So an example would be if they had they go on vacation and they list it on Airbnb. So they're not home while it's while it's being rented, um, but a, a bed and breakfast, they would be required. Okay, thank you. Might I suggest Councilor we Carpenter? take the presentation down? Sorry, Councillor Carpenter, do you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we are designing this, um, we're not designing this around Airbnb specifically, but we're designing this around anybody that may want to rent short-term rentals, right? So I, while Airbnb has a good reputation, they've got a good program, that may not be the case for all those individuals that decide to rent on a short-term basis on their own. Uh, yes, so this would be looking at, as you described, Councillor uh, Carpenter, um, is the, the use and any, any short-term rental accommodation, whether it be through Airbnb like described or or other other platforms. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Antofsky, you have a question? I do, thank you. Alexandra, have, have staff looked at options such as Nathan um, was talking about in terms of, of two tiering, uh, different licensing costs? I, I mean, I don't know how difficult that that might be, and again, it might not be through an Airbnb. It would be something else. So I don't. I'm not sure how we would restrict or manage that. But is that something we've looked at? Um, thank you, Councillor Antosky. Uh, the example, um, just from the from the zoning side, I'll, I'll speak to it, and then um, Jill Binkley from our licensing department will also um, speak to that. Um, so from from the zoning perspective, uh, I have not uh, reviewed the city of. Uh, Calgary, um, the municipalities that I had looked into as part of um, the review um, did not have that type of approach. Um, but I can I can for sure look into it to see what um, what what type of regulations they are they are proposing and and have for that two tiered approach. So, um, Jill, if if you wanted to speak further to that question. Uh, thanks, Alexandra and Councillor Antosky. Um, so we have reviewed a number of municipalities. Uh, the city of Calgary, I think, is one we will take some more review with uh, for the two-tiered approach. Um, what we have found is that a number of municipalities are trying to find their way in this type of category. Um, so while it may be possible to do the two-tiered system, um, we'd probably just still rather get that first year of data to see exactly what we're dealing with, um, which is sort of what we've proposed in the report. We do have some staffing concerns just based on the size of the team and the potential for compliance um, issues. We have recently uh, reached out to the City of Toronto, who does have a registration process, just to try and get some numbers. Um, they're new to this as well. So what we know is um, they have 3,500 applications approved in the city of Toronto. They were expecting over 20,000. Um, so they have a team of about six right now that are dealing with that and they've received uh, approximately 600 complaints so far. So that's sort of the data that we have of people that are 
again, finding their way through this. So we're, we're hesitant on the two category approach or the two tiered approach at this point, just until we get some more information. All right, thanks. Thanks for those answers. Any follow up, Councillor Antoski? No, I'm, I'm good at the, this point, but I would like you know us to look at that just to have that in the back pocket so that uh, we at least have more information as, as we do move forward. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Martin, you can go ahead with your question. Thank you. And first, might I suggest you take down the presentation so that more people can be seen on the screen. But uh, what mechanism is in place to ensure that people will register for whatever system we do put in place? Uh, Councillor Martin, thanks for the question. So right now, what we would have is sort of a voluntary program and you would register, indicate all the information um, in the online system, sort of a govern yourself accordingly, you agree to the terms and conditions, here's your good neighbor guide, these are bylaws you may want to be aware of in operating this type of a thing. And then what we can do is uh, filter the complaints that do come in. So if it's noise related, you know, it goes to that team. If it's zoning related or garbage, we can kind of, again, gather the data that's out there. So um, we may not realize that uh, someone is not registered until we do receive a complaint. And then we could take the education route and uh, forward on the registration, similar to how we're doing with uh, RVs right now. Okay, and would there be a mechanism in place where if they get two or three of these letters and still don't register, then we start finding them or something along those lines? Uh, through Councillor Martin, I think we would have to look at that through the bylaw when it comes back to Council, um, so that we could have some enforcement measure that would obviously be approved by Council, but yeah, we would have to have some, sort of that hook at the end um, for the import, enforcement, fees, uh, enforcement fees after compliance has been exhausted. So it would actually equal like a provincial offence. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Any follow-up question? Thank you very much. Councillor Wall, you can go ahead with your questions. Awesome. Uh, first is a question that we might not be able to answer here, but maybe we can answer it at a later date. Um, is there any cooperation between, if this goes through, between us and any of the people who are facilitating the rentals of these? So in other communities, are they ensuring that Airbnbs who sign up on their platform are following local regulations and rules? And that's just a question. And then the second was, does this affect existing Airbnbs or whatever they're calling short-term accommodations or will this only uh, affect ones after the fact? Like what if you already own one? Uh, thank you, Councillor Wall. Um, I will answer the questions that I can and I will um, also ask Jill, if she has any um, further further discussion on that. Um, in regards to um, the use, uh, currently uh, short-term rental accommodations are not a permitted or defined use under the zoning bylaw. So it would apply to all because it is, it is a new use um, going forward. So you're not allowed to operate an Airbnb in Brantford? There is not currently regulations for it under the zoning bylaw. So they, they do exist, um, but there's no, there's no permissions in our zoning bylaw for that at this time. Okay. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Right, Councillor Wall, I just wanted to note that we would capture as part of the registration process anybody that is operating or was operating previous to whatever is implemented. And regarding cooperation with the organizations that facilitate short-term rentals? Um, certainly we would uh, welcome any cooperation with any of the platforms. Um, we have noted that some municipalities uh, do work closely with 
the platforms to share like registration numbers, for example. Um, I believe the city of Toronto, you have to note your registration number on your listing. So there are some, um, some collaborative efforts that have taken place that we could certainly explore with any of the platforms operating in Brantford. Thank you. Any, up, any follow up question, Councillor Wall? No, I'm good, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councillor Carpenter, you can go ahead with your question. Oh, thank you. Um, how will the neighborhood know uh, that there's a, a short term rental in their neighborhood? Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Um, there, unless um, there was a complaint or um, uh, a, a zoning bylaw amendment or, or minor variance application, there would be, if they're able to operate as, as of right, there would not, from my understanding, be any contact um, with the members of, of the, like the surrounding area. They may, as, as the owner, speak to their, to their neighbor, um, um, but there might not be, uh, there's no requirement for that discussion. Um, however, the, the idea of a principal residence uh, use may, may um, help with that, with that situation as then it is the owner's um, principal residence that is being rented out. There is a more neighborly um, um, uh, feel to it or nature to it as it, it is not then creating something like uh, a unit that's just being constantly rented out as short-term accommodation. It, it, is, it is their home. So that, that may um, help with the uh, neighborhood um, impact. Well, uh, I, I suppose uh, unless they were sort of um, away for six months and they rented it 28 days and 28 days. Uh, I just have some, so how, what I'm hearing is that we're going to zone them for, throughout the city anywhere. You don't have to actually have a license. We encourage you to, but we're not going to do anything if you don't. Um, we're not gonna know where they are. Uh, we're not, so I, I don't know what the regulation is. It sounds like there's no real regulation here uh, and there's no way of controlling it. Um, I, I'm just trying to understand what the purpose is of, of, of doing this whole process if we're not going to, uh, these are these are businesses. These are businesses. Someone's short-term rental. Whether you're not there for six months or not, you're you're earning a revenue. Uh, you have to declare that revenue. Uh, you're even what in your own house or not, you're earning a revenue. Uh, so it, it's a business, and you're competing against other businesses uh, that pay commercial taxes and that compete. Uh, and uh, you won't be paying commercial taxes, you'll be paying residential taxes. I got a lot of concerns with, with us just going down this road without really being sure about how we're gonna regulate it, how the neighborhood gonna know. And, uh, and if someone doesn't have to be licensed, how can we revoke a license for someone not complying with regulations and doing and being the right, a good neighbor. So I got a lot of concerns with going down a road like this, just so uh, what it looks like willy nilly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Any follow-up question? No? Councillor Wall, I still see your hand up. Did you have a follow-up question? No, I apologize. Oh, okay. Thank you. Councillor Sless, go ahead with your questions, please. Yeah, it was just regarding parking, and I, I'm not, if I remember correctly, the presentation, uh, you haven't resolved the parking and exactly how that's going to be applied, is my understanding. But if, if you're saying, I think the proposal you, you indicated, if there was three bedrooms that were uh, potentially could rent out or four bedrooms that could potentially rent out, you would have to have four off street parking places. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, through, through you, uh, Councillor Celeste. So currently we are, are looking towards um, uh, proposals uh, or, proposed regulations for parking. At this time, that was what um, the, the uh, Committee of the Whole had recommended at, at the um, meeting for the licensing. So that would be one parking space in um, the uh, driveway um, was what was required per, per bedroom. 
However, um, that approach has not, um, I've not seen that approach applied in the municipalities um, that I have reviewed at this, at this time. Um, so I am, I am looking further into, into parking regulations um, and um, what, what we could do um, in, regards, in regards to that. So there are, there are multiple ways um, to regulate the parking. So for example, uh, the city of Oakville requires one additional parking space um, for, for, an, for a rental. Um, um, and whereas many of the municipalities I looked at did not require parking. So we're currently working on a, on a proposal to, to bring to the Committee of the Whole um, in regards to regulating the parking and further speaking with our uh, transportation department in regards to that as well. Okay, well, I, I would suggest there has to be some type of off-street parking, I would think, provided, or you're going to plug neighborhoods up with, with cars that, that don't actually live there. Um, but by the same token, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know how you do that. Like, I, if, if there's three potential rooms, that then if they only rent out one, does that mean they only have to have parking for one? But if they rent out two, now they need parking for two? How do we even know that? Um, like it, it, I don't really understand how this works either. It, 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 it's, I think as Councillor uh, Carpenter said, it, it's kind of wishy-washy. I'm not really sure we're putting a marshmallow into a parking meter here. I think we don't really know what we're, how we're going to do this. So um, I, I think we got a lot of thinking to do before this ever becomes reality. Um, and further, sorry, Councillor Celeste. So just as a minimum, we would require um, the parking uh, for the, like say if someone rents out their entire unit or their entire accessory dwelling unit, that that unit, the accessory dwelling unit or the residential use requires a parking space. And if they're renting out the entire one, then that would, that would provide that parking. Um, hopefully that makes sense in, as an example. Yeah, that, that's one example, but I think that's the least example. I, I think from what I can gather, and I didn't even know this kind of stuff went on, but it appears that people are taking in boarders in a sense. Yeah. Um, they're becoming boarding houses. Uh, so I'm not really sure how you regulate that, but uh, God bless you and good luck. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I think um, Tanya had a, a follow-up point to, to make as well. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, just if I, just if I could, let's talk. So I know that's been brought up uh, a little bit already this evening, but this is a new program, not just for Brantford looking at it, but for many municipalities. So that was why when we positioned the report to committee and to council, we said you need a starting point because otherwise we do not have the staff. If you set the, the rules at a level that we couldn't even come close to enforcing, then we've set ourselves up for failure. So what we've suggested is just start with the registration program. Let's understand the market, understand what these programs are, learn from our neighbors and other municipalities and then look at, you know, a, a year from there or six months out was actually what the amendment came back to and said, let's look at where we are six months in once we've got some stronger uh, data to look at. So that's, you're seeing the infancy of our program come through, which also requires a zoning uh, change. The parking and the primary residence piece were amendments on the floor at committee. So they weren't part of the count, the staff members report. So then we have to take back that information and a part of this is what Alexandra's speaking of as well. We take that information back. We look at what is happening in the neighborhoods. What could we actually enforce? Is there other parking reg regulations that may be stronger that rather than inside of a licensing program? Because we tabled it as a registration program because it wasn't going to have the same a level that our licensing programs do. Our licensing programs have inspections. They have other requirements which are more stringent, which is what we focus our staff complement on the education and compliance piece. So we said with this, start with the registration program, which gives us the ability to learn the market, to learn what the rules may be. And to Councillor Antoski's point, it may be that you look at the two tiered system. Is there ones that are different? But right now we are functioning and that we don't exactly know what our market is because we have COVID impacts. We have have a different year that is in front of us. So you, with 
the direction coming out of hotels and motels, we wanted to say, look at your short-term accommodations and then uh, take a good hearty look at what your market is like and then go from go from there. So I don't know if that helps clarify. It would be definitely, it's a bylaw. So there is provincial offenses at the end of the day, we would be able to write a ticket, but it's certainly that first six months before we come back at the interim report is a sort of, I know Jill had said, govern yourself accordingly, but it's education, it's getting the word out we do are there other licensing categories list them on the website i'd want to look into some concerns as to listing properties that may or may not have full occupancy all the time so we'd have to look at some of those but that's a part of that infancy program and learning what this program would look like okay. that helps me understand a lot of it tanya uh, do we currently inspect hotel rooms we, we have an inspection program for certain aspects of the hotels and motels. There was a, um, when that report came through, the bylaw enforcement team uh, did put some information for council and committee's consideration that it would only be the large um, like global areas. So the um, hallways, the pools get inspected, for example, uh, they don't necessarily go into each individual, like hundreds of hotel rooms. There was, um, the, the wording right in this moment is escaping me, but essentially it's the common areas, I believe is how it's phrased, that they would take a look at those or any life safety concerns. Would we be contemplating looking at the common areas in people's homes? Again, because this program is in its infancy in a lot of other areas, I do not believe inside inspections are being done. And you're looking at that, you know, the Toronto example is our biggest example that is out there. But I do not believe that there are actually going into individuals' homes. Um, and that's why, again, we are starting with that registration program, which is what would include the good name. You've heard the good term good neighbor, uh, which we were going to make sure that they had information on that. They're also, you know, attesting to what their property is. We could look at them hearing uh, maybe terms about signage maybe we need to look at that but again I've got some concerns about broadcasting the property so we just have to be careful and maybe again learn from some of those other municipalities but I, I do not believe the internal inspections are being done. Hey, just a couple more things if I could um, I, I'm really concerned about a level playing field uh, when you have these hotels playing paying you know horrific rents uh, or, or you know to develop a a hotel, uh, the staffing that they require, and, and all, all the compliance they have to contend with, and then somebody can just uh, go into, into business with them and, uh, and, and compete with them, uh, and it certainly isn't a level playing field. One's got a huge expense, and the other's basically renting out an empty room in their house, so I, I, that concerns me, and the other one is I don't know if we will ever get to know the market, uh, Tanya. It, if people don't register, then they don't register, then they don't exist. And, and, and it, I would think that would be the majority, not the minority. Uh, they're going to go, holy moats, I'm not going to get involved in that. There'll be all kinds of red tape. Uh, I'll just quietly do my little thing. And uh, who's going to bother me over one bedroom? That, that I, I could see that attitude developing very quickly out in the marketplace. It's a tough one to try and get them to register. I, I don't really know how you do that. And so um, through, again, I'm, I'm so used to being at council, I'm through the chair, but they're, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm so trained for that, but um, we hear you, we hear, and this is exactly that what was getting, um, coming through the committee um, discussion as well, is that that's why it was sort of starting again with this registration program, and it was at $50, which is in line with what our group home registration process is, and, you know, we've heard it around the table before that most individuals are law-abiding citizens, right, and so they'll want to have that recognition, they'll want to meet those requirements. You're right, there may be a few that want to sort of go around legislation that's required of them. But at the end of the day, there is teeth to this. It's just not the same as a licensing program. So we've tabled it as registration just to differentiate the two types of programs, because you could end up at the end of the day wanting to strengthen your program. And then council and committee would need to consider what that would look like um, from there. But I, I, we certainly hear that. Um, and this was, again, coming from that hotels and motels discussion, that you'd want to consider the short-term accommodation market. And within those reports, which talks about the housing uh, concerns as well, certainly the social services group, um, they've provided some comments about, you know, that this is actually impacting their ability for stable housing market. So um, there's, there is a lot to this. It is a very big picture. You're right. Um, so that's why a lot of municipalities are, again, just, just starting out in this and trying to come up with some best practices on how to handle it. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Councillor Sless. Councillor Antoski, you have a question? 
thank you. Some comments and questions, and and a lot of what's just been said by Tanya and, and Councillor Slash and Car Councillor Carpenter are some of my thoughts. I think. Um, it, Councillor Sless was talking about, you know, what's the incentive to register, and that's where my my brain was going. Um, <coughs> and I bless you. <laughs> and, I, and I realized that Hold that mute um, button. <laughs> So, so Councillor says, just to give you some indication, my daughter who pre pre pandemic traveled a lot, and she used platforms like Airbnb. I mean, she would be renting a couch for Pete's sake, or just a den or a, um, and so that there's a lot of that that goes on. But the benefit for those people that are renting it out to be on one of these platforms is for her to be able to find it. So somebody doing it under it's it's a lot more difficult for me to rent a room out in my house and not be using one of these platforms because nobody's going to find me right so so there is that incentive but i i liked i think alexandra you mentioned something that on some of the they had to um register their registration number or something they had to indicate kind of that they were a validated jill was it you jill <laughs> sorry <laughs> Um, yes, Councillor Antoski. So uh, some are implementing. Uh, so say the city issues your registration number. You know, after you've filled out everything you need to fill out, and then you are required to post that actually on your listing. So, so maybe that is the incentive. That could be an incentive to registering if we marketed that right, saying you know that look for the registered uh, leasers or renters or whatever. But I, I do agree that there has to be. There has to be a way to enforce. There has to be um, it, there has to be an incentive to register, or or people are just going to do whatever they can on their own. Um, the internet is a is a valuable uh, tool that some people can use really well, and some people won't need the larger platforms. Although I I do get the I get people wanting to use that tool. It makes their life a lot easier. So it's. Uh, I think it was Councillor Suss that said, God bless you, finding the balance on this. But I do think with every you know, opportunity, there also has to be that other side to it to make sure that we're managing this. OK, thank you, Councillor Antoski. Does anyone have any further questions? I don't see any hands raised at this time. Hey, Darlene, it's, it's Joe. I just want to add a couple of points here, sure. too. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for everyone that was able to show up. This is the, the value of engagement that we get out of these uh, open houses uh, or next to none. We, uh, we've uh, heard some really good points made by uh, the delegates and, and some of council this evening. And I think that's, you know, in part what we'll take away uh, from this meeting this evening and, and address some of the, the comments that we actually heard. Um, I, I agree with uh, Madam Clerk there in terms of, you know, it's a starting point. We have nothing now and the importance of actually getting something out there so we can zone for it, we can register for it, gives us some level of, of scrutiny and, and the teeth, if you will, to, to look further at these as, as, we, as we learn from it. Uh, and, and I think Alexandra had already mentioned that, you know, other, other municipalities are undergoing the same kind of of uh, review with their Air Airbnbs or short-term uh, rental accommodations. So um, I think we are gonna keep learning from it and it, we have nothing now. And the main thing is that we hope to bring something forward to committee and council, which would at least give us some regulation to, to start. And, and, and you know, the, the whole notion of not really landing on anything with respect to parking was, you know, put on the floor on kind of on the fly that evening uh, through uh, through the Cal uh, through the previous Cal meeting in in March, so um, I think that's something that we could look at in a little bit more detail and maybe tie it to the regu uh, registration process. Just wanted to add those extra kind of comments and uh, once again just uh, say thank you for everyone that's uh, been able to participate in this evening's uh, open house. Thanks, Joe. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Yeah, just one, uh, Joe. Is there is there not an ability like why do we have to zone the whole city? Why can't we say we're going to zone commercial strips or or high intensification corridors where housing uh, exists on a major thoroughfare or where commercial uh, uh, activity already exists? Um, 
why, why is it that we seem to think that we have to zone this throughout the whole city uh, and without knowing where it is and no one has to apply anymore? Why, why, why is that the thinking? Right. Uh, thanks, Councillor Carpenter. So uh, I don't know if it came through in Alexandra's pre presentation, but the idea is that, you know, we're going to limit these to certain residential zones as well as some mixed use or commercial type zones. So that will be there. And I think, you know, the, the fact that if you have an, a resident or constituent in your ward counselor that has, you know, a concern with maybe, you know, a neighbor a couple doors down uh, doing an Airbnb, we have no teeth right now. If we regulate for it, then we can start that whole enforcement idea of, 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 uh, of reviewing and, 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 you know, conducting those types of inspections or issuing those types of orders. Um, based on at least having something in place uh, on the get-go. And, and I can understand that right now uh, we don't have anything, right? So, you know, and, you know, we have a definition in terms of bed and breakfast, but it's not, it's not the same as an Airbnb. So, and that, that's been very, made very clear by our, our building department in terms of the interpretation of that definition. Yeah, I'm not so frightened of the Airbnb model. It's those that aren't Airbnb that I'm concerned about getting access throughout our community. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Anyone else? Alexandra, I don't see any hands raised for questions or comments. Oh. Oh. I'd just like to extend a, a very big thank you for all that were able to attend the meeting tonight. Um, and if you do have any comments or questions, uh, feel free to email me. Um, if you're viewing this on YouTube, um, my email address is, is available on, the, on that page um, that you use to access the YouTube. Uh, so feel free to, to reach out to me with your, your comments and, and thank you very much. And, the meeting is adjourned. Have a great night. Thanks, Alexandra. And if I could just, uh, before we wrap things up this okay. evening, also say thank you once again. And, and uh, in terms of those next steps going forward, we're going to uh, consider everything we heard this evening and bring forward a, a, uh, a planning staff report uh, in the coming months to uh, Committee of the Whole um, based on what we've heard and you know, best practices in other jurisdictions. Uh, and, and continue to work with um, our, our licensing department uh, moving forward. Um, so that, those would be the, the next steps. Um, um, and just uh, in, in consideration of this meeting this evening, we, you know, we did circulate, um, you know, we were only required to do uh, for these city-wide type rezoning applications, um, a, a civic news um, notice. We actually did provide a notice to Airbnb and that's why we have Nathan here this evening as well as all the hotels and motels within the city as well. So we have um, tried to exhaust what we could in terms of our engagement program uh, for, this, for this review. So I guess with, with, with that said and not seeing no other hands, then we would uh, conclude the, the meeting this evening, the neighborhood meeting. And once again, thank you for all your participation. Good night, everyone. Good evening. Good night.